Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, so as you can see from my affiliations, I'm a philosopher of science rather than an archaeologist. Um, I think about analogies in science, and in particular, one thing I've looked at is this good old analogy debate in archaeology. Um, I'm really excited to be here to be able to try and present some of my ideas to actual archaeologists, okay. and then you can tell me whether what I have to say is completely misguided or utterly trivial, or hopefully somewhere in between. Um, so the framing for this debate, as I'm going to take it, is uh, what Alison Wiley has called the interpretative dilemma. And by that she means uh, this dilemma that occurs in many aspects of scientific, of, sorry, of archaeological um, interpretation, which is this dilemma. On the one hand, archaeology wants to say something interesting, something substantive about what culture and life was like in the past. But on the other hand, you want to avoid just unrestricted speculation where you can just say anything you want. Um, and so if you think in terms of the theory wars, you can sort of think of these as the two extremes. So, you know, the ones that really try to go for being able to say something interesting, that might be sort of an extreme post-processualist who just thinks, you can just say anything at all, don't worry about the evidence, just say whatever you want. And then on the other hand, you can have an extreme new archaeologist who thinks that, no, 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 we should only say what we can really prove scientifically, and that turns out to be very little. And of course, these are, ex I'm just, these are uh, caricature positions. I don't think that anybody really subscribes to these extreme positions. Um, and in any case, I'm going to assume that these extreme positions aren't really tenable. So what we really want is some kind of middle position that tries to, to balance that, um, that trade-off. So going on to our analogies, I think they're, they, um, they're one context where this trade-off occurs. On the one hand, uh, analogies are a source of rich and compelling hypotheses about the past. And comparing past material or past societies to ones we already know is a good way of coming up with interpretations of how things might have been in the past. But on the other hand, as many <coughs> archaeologists have argued about, uh, analogy seems to rely on the assumption that the uh, past would resemble the familiar, and there are many reasons to be skeptical about whether that's the case. Um, so Wiley has tried to address this problem by um, arguing that actually it's not so bad. There are actually sound strategies for critically evaluating analogies. And so one way she's put it recently is to say that um, archaeological evidence can bite back. So we're not just because relying, relying on an analogy doesn't mean we can't do anything uh, further. We can actually um, go into them uh, and um, value them critically. I want, so I think that's a good starting point. Um, but I'd like to add something to that story. Um, so what I want to ask and um, work towards is to ask, well, why should you actually pursue an analogy in the first place? What's so interesting about analogies? And I'm going to try and develop an answer that answers that question in terms of saying you can actually learn from failures. Um, and I'm trying to explain um, how I'm thinking about this as we go forward. So um, I'll start by going through some of these strategies for critically evaluating analogies. And I'll look at three particular such strategies, um, the first of them is to question whether you have any reason to assume that the two things you're comparing should resemble each other. The second one is to look for what kinds of expected features of the thing you're trying to interpret you should expect to find if the analogy is true. And finally, um, using analogies to come up with other pers possible interpretations. And um, to make this more concrete, I'm going to explain this in terms of the case study involving uh, Penelope Allison's work on um, <laughs> campaign household artifacts, and in particular, um, some of her discussion of, of the Samian ware that's been found in Pompeii. So Alison has, um, she has criticized the use of analogies in Roman archaeology, and I think it's quite an interesting uh, point that this isn't just a question in prehistoric archaeology. Analogies is used in any, any field of archaeology to some extent or another. Um, and so I think this is an interesting one to, to look at. Okay. So this is a um, schematic representation of an analogy. Um, so the idea is that you have a, um, a subject, that's the thing you want to 
interpret. And you have a source, that's the uh, domain where you are taking your analogy from. And then you notice they have some similarities. They might have some differences as well. But then you hope to be able to say that there's sort of a target, the X that you want to say, well, maybe the subject um, has something similar. So to make this concrete, um, <laughs> wonderful stock photo. Um, so if your subject, the thing you want to interpret, that's the Samian where pottery you can find in Pompeii. Um, then you want, want to think about how might this have been used. Well, you might think, hmm, it might have been used as tableware. That's a common, um, that's a common assumption. And you might think it might have been used something like this. So each diner has their own individual dining set. Um, that's, a, that's one tempting interpretation you might go for. And that's one of the interpretations that Allison criticizes. So I want to go through some of the arguments he gives against this interpretation just to illustrate how you can critically assess an analogy. Um, the first strategy is just to ask sort of what reason do we actually have to think that, there, that these two things should resemble each other? Is there any reason to think that the way that people ate in Pompeii is going to resemble the kind of modern dining habits we have today? And you might rightly think, well, that doesn't seem to be any sort of particular reason why that should be the right analogy. And so one thing that Alison says is just, well, um, if you're not really looking at any of the context, um, this isn't sort of, there isn't really any um, a priori reason you should think this analogy is good. In some cases, you might have that evidence. Um, if you had evidence that you know, a particular group had settled in Pompeii and we know how they use their dining ware, that might give you some reason to think that they would keep those habits. It's obviously not a very, it's not a perfect argument, but at least some reason to think it. But we seem to reflect that in this case. Okay, so the second strategy, the idea here is that you say, well, suppose it was used in this way, in the way that you can see in the source. Well, think about, sort of generally speaking, what kinds of how would that work? And then think about what kinds of features would you then expect to see in the subject area um, if that were the case. So you're basically testing it by looking for other things that might indicate whether this analogy is um, applied in that case. And so one of the pieces of evidence that Alison points out is that um, with some of the bowls uh, that had edible remains left in them, each bowl had a single type of food in it. So you had one bowl with plums, one bowl with olives, and so on. And she points out that doesn't really seem to fit the picture that each person has their own plate of food, unless you know, one person really liked olives <laughs> and one person really liked plums. So that's at least some, again, that's some evidence against the analogy and seems to suggest this interpretation isn't the right one. Um, the final strategy I'm going to go through is to try to think of other analogies, other possible interpretations. Um, Philosophers often tend to assume that analogies plays a positive role in supporting something. I think something that's interesting to look at the way um, analogies uh, are often used in archaeology is it's a critical tool to question other interpretations by looking for other possible things, other po possible things that could be the case. So one alternative interpretation that um, Alison mentions is it might have been used as a kind of buffet-style dining. Um, now, she questions that because the dining rooms weren't really large enough to accommodate any kind of buffet. So that one she, she quickly rejects, but then she comes up with another one. It might have been used as communal bowls, so where you would pass the bowl amongst the diners. And she also mentions that that um, is a style of dining that was actually quite common in Europe, at least until the 19th century. So um, maybe that's another possible interpretation. Okay. So one thing we can take from this is that um, so if we agree that there are good critical ways that we can really evaluate analogies and get some hold on whether they're plausible enough, well, one thing we can at least say is that they're not all equal. We, we, we shouldn't just say, well, you know, analogy is from analogy. You can just do anything you want. Um, we do have some critical tools for distinguishing the more plausible ones from the less plausible ones. And in particular, it seems like there are good critical tools available to archaeologists for discovering when you've made a mistake. Um, and I've given you some strategies for that. Um, 
the question I want to raise is, so how much is this actually progress? It's all well and good that we can sort of predict <coughs> these two interpretations, but you might still wonder whether the third one is the only possible one. There might be many further interpretations you can come up with. Um, Alison, at least, doesn't really go further than this. So we're sort of left with what still just seems to be a potential interpretation. And so if you want to become, so if you want to take on sort of a pessimistic attitude, you might still wonder, have we actually made any progress or have we just sort of pointed out some things we don't know? So I want to try and suggest a way of thinking about analogies that tries to make a virtue out of this picture. And so, so um, and there might be some cases where you can actually get better evidence than in this case, but um, I want to try and give a story about th these cases where you're just left with a suggestive analogy and, and not much more. What can we say about that? Can we still give a story that makes it seem like we've made some progress? Or that archaeology has made some progress? So, uh, um, so one first step I want to suggest is um, if you think about what if you think of an of archaeology as trying to tell us something about human uh, culture, um, and in particular, it's trying to say something about human culture, not just sort of in specific cases, but about something about how human culture varies across time and place at different times and places. Well, then it seems like some of the interesting questions are going to be comparative ones. For instance, how similar might the dining habits in Pompeii be to the dining habits we have today, or how different might they be? But if that's the case, then that seems to be exactly the kinds of questions you raise by trying out an analogy-based interpretation. You, try, you raise these questions about how do things we know differ from the ones, so how do we, the things we want to know more about, the subject, differ from the things we already know about? And so even if it turns out that an analogy like that is false, and we can sort of see that that's at least not the right one, we still learn something interesting because we've learned about a difference. And that in itself is a piece of positive knowledge. So the first point I want to make is just that uh, it can be worth pursuing analogy-based interpretations, even if most of them turn out to be false. And even in those cases where it doesn't really seem like we can tell which one is the right one, we still learn something if we, if we can tell which ones are the wrong ones. Uh, the second suggestion I want to make is based on a very nice paper by John Hero uh, called Honoring Ambiguity, and the second part is Problematizing Certitude, but I'm going to st uh, stick with the positive idea. So what Hero is criticizing in this paper is, uh, generally speaking, the tendency of some archaeologists to overemphasize certainty as the thing you should be aiming for, and she tries to push this idea that it can actually be valuable in archaeology to... Um, to have knowledge that's more ambiguous and less certain than is uh, um, sometimes before. So let's, let me try to run through this uh, line of thinking. Um, the first, uh, let's go back to this idea that I mentioned before, that uh, many interesting archaeological questions are comparative. And in particular, the one interesting kind of comparison you might make is concerns um, what is the, what kind of relation can we have to the past and, um, in our culture today or in different cultures today maybe what kinds of relations can we have to the past and one kind of relation we can have to the past concerns what we know about it or what we don't know about it and learning more about the things we can actually know about the past seems also to tell us something interesting about that kind of relation so if we critically evaluate uh, the analogies and some of the other interpretations we might have, um, that will allow us to learn more about what we don't know. And we can end up in a situation where uh, what we've learned is how difficult it is to know more and what we don't know. So again, even if what we end up learning is that we actually really don't know much after all, that seems again to be something that's valuable and some, a valuable contribution that archaeology can make. Um, so just to conclude this argument, um, I think we've got a picture where we can say that not all our analogies are, e are equal, so we have avoided sort of the unrestricted speculation um, problem. Um, and it's possible to expose mistakes and failed analogies. But <clears throat> um, we can still maintain the idea that it's 
difficult to make possible claims. Not impossible, but at least um, something that's difficult to do in archaeology. And I think um, you don't want to overemphasize how easy it is to actually show things. Um, but anyway, but even though, so we have those two out of the dilemma. The middle position then is that we can still make progress through these failed analogies. That's my argument. Thanks. Thank you.